Sorry, I guess <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do the introduction. So welcome everyone. Um, appreciate everyone's patience with the organic nature of these meetings, as you can tell. Um, and we're all still in the process of learning Zoom uh, and everything uh, with this new world of telehealth and trying to survive in the world of COVID. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today. We have um, our executive director, uh, Luke Smith, and our uh, advancement director from El Futuro, Kerry Brock, on the call, who will be presenting to you all on basically just what our journey has been at El Futuro, what we have done um, once we had to close our doors on March 16th, um, and what we have done to try to stay sustainable, and then what we are continuing uh, and planning on doing um, as the situation unfolds. And um, I hope I'm not speaking out of place, Luke and Carrie, but I think this will be very interactive. Um, we want folks to jump in with questions and comments and really we're sharing our experience. We're not saying we have the answers. Uh, we're really also hoping for this to be an opportunity for us to learn from one another and how other folks are managing the situation in their organizations. So with that, I will turn it over to Luke and Carrie who will take it away. Great. Well, this is um, definitely interactive. And what we want to do uh, while people are still kind of coming on the phone is give some context and then understand your context as well. So um, we're working with an understanding of that this is a weird time. And before the crisis, it was interesting enough. Um, and now it's like, wow, we've woken up and we found ourselves in this weird moment. Um, I'm looking at what I created last night and it's uh, from conversations we've had in recent days, which is about um, how are we doing and where are we at? And so we're, are, we're in the crisis moment right now and we're watching the news every day and we're seeing whatever news station you trust to bring you whether or not it's an all clear when the governor is going to wave the flag and say we don't have to shelter in place anymore. Um, and when they did wave the flag at the first, how much we were kind of like, really? Okay, oh, oh yeah, we really need to do it. And then there's gonna be a time when they wave the flag and we all kind of are like a little stunned and are needing to think, okay, what do we do after this? And that's gonna last for a period of time. And then we're gonna have back to normal. And the uh, post-crisis moment when they do wave the flag and we go back, um, that's when we're gonna all see our services either with grants that we're working on or with billable services, that's when the payments that we're, we're charging right now and we're doing right now are gonna come either to us or not come to us as much as we thought they were gonna come to us. And it's gonna be a moment where we kind of go, oh, a sigh of relief, or we tighten our belt and go, man, this is not good. Um, and then there's gonna be back to normal where we're all gonna be paying off trillions of dollars of borrowing from the federal government. And they're gonna look at us and say, okay, we need to do something different now. We need to live differently than we've lived in the past. Austerity or what? We're not sure. Um, but those are some different time points. Um, just real quick, I'll show you this. I don't know. Can you see this slide right now? Maybe not. You can't see that? Yes, you can see it. Yeah, so you can see there, that's an interesting kind of like layout. Before COVID, there's the blue. There are several months where we were humming along, everybody was kind of doing their thing. Then all of a sudden there's the shelter in place. Okay, well, let's say it goes from somewhat end of March to 1st of May. So maybe let's say two months shelter in place. Well, then we have a three months transition period, which is gonna run us out to about August. And then we're gonna have a bigger transition time, which how, who knows how long that will, that will last. But that's kind of the framework that we're thinking about right now is like, okay, we got to consider appropriate time points along this journey and know that we're going to have to shift and think differently at different times. So hopefully that's a nice graphic to kind of help you. That's just something we're putting together and we're thinking about. Um, and that leads us into the concept of race don't chase. Um, so Carrie, they've heard enough from me. Why don't you, Talk about race don't chase and where we're learning this wisdom from. 
So there's a great um, podcast that Luke has actually introduced our team to called the Manager's Tools. And they started putting out a series of podcasts very early on in this coronavirus crisis um, about essentially management and leadership through a crisis. And, and the, um, the series title for what they were talking about was Race Don't Chase. And the idea that they were talking about was you know, when you're in a period where you anticipate that you may see your revenues declining and your billing sources kind of shrinking up, the goal is to shrink your expenses faster than your revenues shrink. So if you're thinking, you know, maybe we're going to experience some of our revenues declining over the next three months, well, we want to start today um, shrinking our expense line items so that when those revenue declines do happen, we're kind of ahead of the game. So that's really part of the approach that we've been taking at El Futuro and our whole team has been amazing to be on board with this and to be understanding that we may not feel some of these economic impacts for a while. Um, we're feeling some of them now, we may feel more later, um, but in the meantime, we wanna stay ahead of that curve in terms of our expenses. And just maybe people have already done this because this is what you do on a webinar. You go to that website and you start looking around. Um, but there's the there's the guidance that we're following. Um, we've actually subscribed to this um, site and podcasts for now probably six years. And um, it talks about a lot of different things about just basic management and basic leadership. Um, here under COVID-19 in your company, if you clicked on that one, is where you would see those two podcasts, Race Don't Chase, and you can play those. And they're offering all of those for free right now, which is nice. Um, and a lot of their podcasts are free. So that's our, that's our th theory that we're going with, with our organization trying to understand how we get on top of things. Let's do this. We're um, now wanting to do a quick poll and we'd like to find out where you're located as our audience today. So do I launch the poll or does, nope, somebody else does. So please take a moment to answer this. Raise your hand when you're done or put your head down and put your pencil down. Thumbs up. <laughs> My daughter's in the background reacting to me being a teacher. Okay, so we should show the poll where we're at. Are you gonna do this through the poll or are you gonna put the dots on the map? I wish we were that advanced, but Sophia's just gonna publish the poll. Oh, okay. Can you not see it? No. Oh, let me try it one more time. Oh, wow. Now? Maybe no. I have to unshare me. No, it's... Sometimes it does this. I can tell them, like, I'll tell them to you out loud. Um, most of our people are coming from the Triangle, the Raleigh, Durham and surrounding areas with some people from the Southeast, Triad, Southwest by Mecklenburg County and in Western North Carolina. I'll take a picture of this. Wow. Sorry, I couldn't launch it. So we have a representation at least from there around the state. Oh yeah, there it is. There it is Good yeah. job. I see names in our list. I don't have my video open, but I can see a number of you who we've come to know through La Masita. So it's great to see you today. And one of our goals through this is to um, very much be not just looking out for ourselves, but looking out for everybody else and trying to share secrets and tips and where we're at. So hopefully we can do that today in true La Masita fashion. Um, the next is, what is your context of work? What kind of practices do you have out there? Yeah, that'll be great to know. We know we're definitely thinking about this situation through our own sort of unique mix of funding sources and clients and context and everybody's coming from a different place. I'm 
Mm -hmm. Diana, pick a game. I was gonna say the same thing. Just pick one. Yeah. Yeah, you may be more than one. And feel free to chat the others out in the chat screen if you want. It. Yep. Listen to that. Okay, great. So there's, and I would think some people who are in nonprofit practice or in private practice group of clinicians or somewhere in between the two of those, health clinic, no school-based services today because those people just decided to stop working at this point. <laughs> um, they're out there in La Masita and they'll probably watch on the recording later. Um, so uh, now we want to talk about then, that's our context. We hear your context. Uh, this is where we'll invite you to be in discussion, stop us, raise your hand, chat, do whatever you need to. Um, and we'll hopefully be able to talk through some things. Um, communication for us has meant getting people together, um, getting people on the same page and really trying to work together through this crisis and not having just our leadership do something, but have everybody together. Um, I'm trying to get to my notes here. So give me a brief second. So this is our, we've, we've now gone to uh, regular staff meetings. And when we have people come on the phone for the first 10 minutes before the meeting, um, people can see announcements. And we're really trying to put what are our priorities and goals up front for people to see. Um, and then when they come on those first 10 minutes before the like meeting happens are called the shoulders of a meeting. And it's a nice time to come on and check in with your colleagues and have some fun banter and kind of reconnect with people. We're finding that we need that. We need to reconnect even, uh, I don't want to offend anybody, but even an introverted introspective uh, therapist needs connection with people and needs to have that human touch and human connection. And so we're really saying that not only um, in our appointments, but in our meetings, we're saying that we need to do video. We need to see people, um, that that's very important. Um, and then we're using other types of technology to kind of help us get through right now. Um, in general, that's one of the first stops on our communication tour, but there's other things that we're doing as well. And so um, uh, here you can see that we're scanning the horizon. We're watching out there. We're trying to keep our head up, but we're also trying to keep our head down and do the work. And that's a tough balance. And that's in a leadership position, much more, I think, in focus for us is that we've got to stay watching and prepared for the next change that's coming on the road. You guys through La Mesita are helping us with that. Um, through the network, people are posting, here's a new opportunity. Here's a new thing that's affecting the community. Oh, did you know this? And it helps to kind of extend our scan and our radar. And I hope we're doing the same thing with helping through this today and through other ways that we're helping to kind of help people scan the horizon. Because it really is hard to do two things at once. Keep your hand to the plow and also look up where you're plowing. Farming metaphor. Carrie, do you want to do communicating about priorities? Sure, and you can see some of that in the slide that Luke was talking about previously that's now sort of like a little thumbnail over on the side, but just really uh, continual communication with our staff, with our funders, with our donors, with our whole community about what are our targets and our goals? So what are we up to right now? Things have changed. We're not working in the same space. We're not working in the same way. So just being really clear about, you know, our targets continue to remain, making sure that we're providing good services to our clients, making sure that our staff are staying healthy. Um, and really just, we keep talking about over communicating those things and making sure we're all on the same page. Um, and staying focused on our mission. I mean, this is a moment where there's so much need in the community. Um, in all of our communities, broadly speaking. And um, I know just this morning, some of our team were having a conversation about, should we start providing this type of thing because people are really needing this right now. And so really trying to come back to 
are we staying on our mission? Are we doing all that we can do within our mission to help meet some of the need that's there? Um, and then also just acknowledging and sitting with and having the sort of solid solidarity moment of discomfort with just the uncertainty around how long is this going to last? What's going to be the long-term fallout? Um, how is it going to impact our families, our work environment, our communities, you know, people that we know who are in businesses that are struggling right now? There's just a lot of uncertainty around us and we can do all of our mindfulness techniques and staying present, but we know that that's there and we know that it's behind a lot of our questions as an organization and, um, and kind of the undergirding all of our meetings. So we're just really acknowledging that and honoring it and, um, and paying attention to that as we move forward. And then Luke has actually been using a metaphor that I keep coming back to over and over. I think it's really helpful is I think the first week or two after we decided to close our clinic and we really felt like we were in emergency mode, I think all of us were running like we were in a sprint and then the sprint would be over. <laughs> but now we're understanding, no, actually we're in a marathon. This We need to be pacing ourselves and um, thinking about this for the long term and instead of looking to the end of the race, looking to the next water station and celebrating and honoring those water stations when they arise and noticing them and, um, and taking the comfort in that, but then recognizing we have a next leg of the race to run after that to keep going. And I would just say, um, previous to my work at El Futuro, I worked from home in a telecommuting setting for about 15 years. And communication was the name of the game, even in that setting. I know that my colleagues and I touched base every single day for, even if it was just 15 minutes, first thing in the morning to just kind of remind ourselves of, these are our priorities, this is where we are, these are the challenges we're facing, how we're gonna move forward. And that helped not only keep us on track with our mission and the focus in front of us, but it helped us stay connected as a team. And so that's a part of what, Luke was sharing in our all staff meetings. I think we started out in the early days of this crisis having an all staff meeting three times a week, which typically we do it once a month. So that was a huge change for our team, but we felt like that was important to see each other's faces and stay connected to each other. Now we're doing that twice a week and we may see that um, continue to decline beyond this period um, but at the same time, our clinical teams are having meetings, our administrative teams are having meetings, we're touching base with our direct colleagues every single day. So you see Elizabeth on the call here, she and I work very closely together, she's a lot of the brainchild behind some of this information here. So we're having conversations, sometimes multiple conversations via video daily, just to stay connected to each other and aware of what we're working on. Um, and I, I think that will continue as we work out of this time environment. Yeah, and, and then our administrative team has been meeting. They were meeting daily, and now they're move, meeting twice a week um, to talk about how do they schedule appointments. And, oh, this worked better when we were calling somebody to get them on the, on the line. And we've been making little videos to share out with our patients to say, here's how you use your iPhone, or here's how you use your Android or a tablet. Um, so there's a lot of that. And then our clinicians are meeting several times a week as well to decompress sometimes or just kind of say, I'm not figuring out how to do this. And then that's crosstalk. But seeing each other has been that really important part. One other thing in terms of messaging and target goals, I thought I would bring in this for a moment. This is from our staff meeting just this morning. Um, when we were with all of our staff, we've been using a central graphic like this to talk about the, the different parts of our work. So you can see we have to do marketing and messaging and communication to people. Um, and then we have to think about what does our walk-in clinic look like now in our group program. And so what we did was we actually put those things on hold and we looked over here at video services and said, that's gonna be our first priority, that and staying in communication with people in the community. We prioritized that. But you can see at the top, priorities are very important to just keep in focus. So we've said, we're serving our clients, our patients, we're staying healthy, we're staying employed, and we're helping our La Mesita partners. And those are our like, put the blinders on, let's do it. Um, and so all of that flows from there, but then we have this process that our staff are very familiar with now, and I hope it's working. 
um, that's our intent. And I don't know if others have found other messaging metaphors or um, things like what we're talking about, but that's that's where we would like to hear from you or just borrow from us. Um, but it, it seems like this communication, they say when your, your physical distance goes down that, um, or I'm sorry, when your physical space and distance goes up, when you get further apart from people, that communication goes down and trust goes down, which is really significant because you want to be in communication with people and you want to be trusting your staff and your coworkers. You don't want to have people thinking, well, I'm just working so hard over here and nobody else is doing anything. Why am I saving the day and nobody else is? You don't want to get that resentment. You want to have trust in your, your people you're working with. So those are those are things. The last thing is celebrations. We've always started our meetings or had some part some point in our meetings to have a celebration. And it was last Monday where we started off the day. It was Monday morning or, or the Monday before that. And we started off, we were all, okay, let's celebrate. That was the first thing. And coming into the work week, people were afraid. They were anxious. And it was like a pin drop. Nobody really wanted to celebrate. And somebody actually said that. They were like, it's kind of hard to celebrate right now. So then another staff member said, what about a wishing well time where we just say and acknowledge that um, Fulana's aunt is diagnosed with COVID right now and is in the hospital on oxygen and we just need to hold her for a moment or let's talk about how being at home with kids is ridiculous and it's really hard because they're making noise in the background and I'm trying to hold people in a space that's usually sacred and private for them and now I've got my whatever going on. So the wishing well has been a nice moment as well as the celebrations, keeping the two together. So those are our ways that we're trying to do communication and just overall messaging in our organization. And I hope you felt that in the La Masita network that we've been present, that we've been putting things out there. Um, but if there are any other things you want to chat, um, Juan just messaged me. Sorry, I'm reading. Um, if there's any other ways that you're using communication, if it's through just your video or are there other things that people are doing to stay connected with people right now? Yeah, we'd love to hear from what other folks around the state are doing. And are you feeling connected, I guess, is the thing. Is, are you feeling in communication? You know, it's a tough place to be just reading news reports and seeing certain press conferences all the time. If you have ideas or others, feel free to chat them in. Hopefully this is relevant and important. We do want to look um, Oh, okay, thanks, Angela. So she's chatting in that they have a group chat and check in daily. So Google Drive is awesome, isn't it? <laughs> I like what you're saying, Angela, about discussing interventions. We found that there's, just like we did two weeks ago when we came on and did this same kind of call, people saying, here's how I use puppets or here's how I share a screen or do things like that. And then somebody we else. Have, yeah, we have a couple more chats. Um, so it looks like GD Field um, would like to talk about the potential positives this situation may bring about. Mm -hmm. um, I know that for me, or at least for some clients, the some of the barriers to access to care are actually lowered by being able to join our sessions on the phone. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to talk about any of those, Luke or Carrie. And we want to have a moment at the end as well where we're going to talk about how do we evaluate what we're doing um, because there's going to be some people who say this really works great for me and then there's going to be others who are like i don't want to do video that's not my style so how do we appropriately assess that but overall what you're saying is that there's a silver lining to this cloud and that we're all getting shaken up a little bit trying new yeah. things 
I think it's a little hard to get to everyone's comments on the chat. If folks could actually unmute and just speak these, I think that might be, and also in the interest of human communication, just make it more of a back and forth chat. That's true. So I'm gonna invite Rachel Valentine, Lindsay Taylor, uh, Diana Torres, uh, Megan, if folks feel okay unmuting. Uh, this is Rachel. Um, we started, I just shared that we've started using Microsoft Teams as a communications platform. Um, and part of what um, I am enjoying about it is that it gives us a lot of a lot of flexibility and a lot of different options for ways to communicate. Um, so it meets different people's needs. We can post things and get comments from everybody, or we can just direct chat people. And so it kind of, it, it it provides these virtual ways to replicate like popping into someone's office or catching them on their way to the bathroom or um, you know all these sort of informal communication um, strategies that we use to keep our work going. Mm. Is that a free service, Rachel? Um, it, it, it has been free to us because we already use, uh, we have a Microsoft licenses. Mm. Um, so we use Outlook um, for our, um, email server. And so having that gives us access to Teams as a free additional app. Okay. Great. Thanks to check that out. I know Slack has been another one people have used and enjoy that I can't in my older brain quite figure out yet. Then Megan doesn't have a microphone. She's at the Samaritan Health Center. And they, I like that sharing a poem, a video, a prayer, or something that um, can help people kind of be a little more reflective and introspective. And we've had some of that come through our ranks as well, which has really been nice to take a moment to slow down. Which is something that we're saying a lot. We all need to slow down even in the midst of the sprint. I love the metaphor of the sprint and the water tables because if I ever have run a race, which is, I can count them on one hand, those water tables really don't offer enough for me when I get to that water table. I need a lazy boy recliner or something. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So I'm happy to share this is Diana, um, but you will have to bear with my two girls in the background and my husband also working at home. <laughs> um, so I just, um, I work in a hospital system as well as having a private practice. And I started what I called a social worker support huddle. Um, uh, some of us have to go into the clinics in the hospital. Some of us don't. So it's kind of scary time. So anyway, I started that and basically just let everything you can out, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're, you know, and. Um, experiencing your own fears and then the fears you see in other people and having to hold it together when you're scared too. Um, but I always try and end with either self-care or um, one thing you're grateful for, at least one, um, to kind of close it in a positive way. Because I think lots of us are fearful, particularly if you're a leader, to express fear. Um, but I felt like that gave everybody permission to just vent, um, but end in a Mm, it's really helpful. Thank you. Hey, everyone. My name is Janina and I work for CPC. I actually had a question um, for, I mean, like, quote unquote, leaders or administrators about how are y'all supporting your staff during these moments, like acknowledging that COVID is a worldwide pandemic, acknowledging that this is a crisis, acknowledging the trauma that it's inducing in our communities, in lower income communities. Um, I've been seeing like a lot of different just businesses try to accommodate working from home and not acknowledge that, you know, you're not just working from home, you're working from home. You're staying at home during a pandemic because you have to. So I'm curious to know what are some ways that anyone here has supported their staff during those during these, these moments. I can share something. I'm a um, project manager at El Futuro, also manning the chat and the IT. Um, but I think that one way that we have done that so far is the kind of holding spaces during our all staff meeting. Um, and I wish we could do that more. 
and I also recognize that those meetings are also for us to all learn um, <laughs> what we're doing in the coming week. Um, but I think it's been particularly useful to hear from other coworkers um, that they've given themselves permission to acknowledge that that you're right. It's not just that, you know, oh, we're transferring to video health and working from home and those challenges on themselves are are massive, but also that we have this external stress of of this pandemic. And I think just like having the ability to bring all of our staff together virtually and talk about that has been really helpful. And I think going, just piggybacking on Sophia, I'm also at El Futuro. Um, like today's meeting, um, our leadership team was really transparent about some of the things that they're having to take into account in terms of, you know, what their priorities are, but then also some things that are needing to be cut from the budget. And I think also they're saying like, we want to up our cl clinician um, productivity, but then also are mindful of folks needs and that this is a difficult time. So I think for me personally, because I also do clinical work, having that open discussion and knowing every step of the way where our leadership is at and that they have um, our best interest in mind and also wanting, they have also pressures for the longevity of the organization. I think having that discussion out in the open is a way of caring. And then I think throughout the time, like what you're saying, Janina, um, naming those things and creating that space for saying like, it's okay if, you know, you're not at your 100%, um, you know, 120% capacity during a worldwide pandemic. Like, we understand that everyone's doing their best and we're all here to support each other. So I think that constant messaging, at least for me as a clinician at Futuro, has been helpful. Um, but yeah, curious to hear what other folks on the call have, have done, if, if you are in leadership or if you have been part of an organization. And feel free to chat those in as well. That's helpful if you, if you don't have a microphone. Um, Janina and team, this is Molly. I'm also at El Futuro. And sorry to make this sort of an El Futuro centric response, but I think one of the things that I did as a clinical supervisor um, is I increased the frequency of my communications with my clinical staff and decreased um, how long those appoint those time times were. So we were checking in regularly. And I sort of threw our agenda out the window at the beginning. And the check-in was really a, how are you? What's going on? How can I support you? Um, and kind of getting a sense of what each individual situation was because everyone had a unique dynamic going on, especially in the beginning, trying to figure out workflows and scheduling and technology and just capacity. Uh, so it was really great to have those regular check-ins um, more frequently. We didn't need to spend so much time, but it was really helpful to just get in, a, get in collaboration with each staff person individually um, to have that ongoing conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Molly. I wanted to share Lindsay Taylor. She doesn't have a microphone. She's with NAMI and she, she said um, to ensure everyone's taking a mental health day every week or so. Um, always want to make sure we're covering our helpline, but we're also stressing mental health days even though we are working from home, which is really great to hear. I think another thing is to be um, back to the communication of um, affirming people when they are doing something to take care of themselves. And so uh, it can be that you're agreeing with them and wanting to say, oh, that's a good idea. I'm glad you went for a walk. Um, but go ahead and say it, because if you don't say it, if it hangs that in the air, they may feel like, oh, I'm sorry to be stepping aside to go get a drink of water or to go on a walk or do something, I need this, but I know everybody else is working really hard right now and I wanna pull my weight, but I also just need to take some time. If a colleague or a supervisor can say, I'm glad you're doing that, that speaks into some silence that could grow into a person carrying that as, I hope I'm doing okay here. So just being more verbal and communicating, again, kind of lift up a voice instead of 
a, a nod when you're on the phone and in a teleconference or something it's helpful we're giving a lot of thumbs up like this this day or these days which seem kind of hokey but do it um there's one with an electronic thumbs up we'll move on to the next <laughs> part oh yes go ahead sorry alejandro i have a, a, a quick comment and a suggestion um i think the we don't have day-to-day -day urgencies and so th meetings like this one uh, strategic when you speak about strategic uh, issues and uh, this is a great opportunity to do that so more of this would be would be good uh, I'm, I'm a volunteer with El Futuro didn't mention that and my suggestion is um, in line with the communication priorities that have been set um, we could uh, use this days to invite uh, different uh, all the stakeholders in, in the organization to bring to send short videos uh, the YouTube channel uh, El Futuro's YouTube channel uh, has only 35 subscribers right now and uh, short videos are a very powerful uh, tool uh, especially try to try to start collecting them now and maybe use them some in the future uh, having our our donors and collaborators uh, speaking about El Futuro uh, it's a very powerful fundraising tool and so people are with the computers all the time now nowadays so it's a good opportunity if we give them some guidelines to start collecting these videos Mm. Uh, and uh, at some point, more sooner than later, a uh, YouTube uh, giving program, which now is only for 100 nonprofits in the US, it's in a better state, will come, will expand surely within the US. And uh, it would be a fantastic fundraising to, tool for, to fundraise online. Uh, so just getting ready for that time, thinking strategically, as I mentioned at the beginning. Hmm. Well, you're naturally linking something between what our programmatic work is and then our stakeholders and supporters. So that's a thank you for that. Um, it's a place that I don't think we as clinicians feel real comfortable going. We don't even want to talk to our clients or patients about payments it's like just uncomfortable and we always have to relearn how to do that and set boundaries and not give away services for free and whatever so um we need to talk about finances let's talk about them let's talk about budget and finances and uh this is our our slide to say some of the things that we're thinking about and we're, we're talking about it all the time so there you see the timeline which is the one that it showed at the first, which shows kind of the different stages that we're in. And that's a guess that's gonna to change tomorrow, maybe. Um, I don't know if we're, you're feeling a little more optimistic with some of the reports coming in that maybe the estimates are gonna be lower. Um, so hopefully we see something that returns to normal. But the graphic on the left is a pie graph that we keep showing to all of our staff. And this is the transparency that Juan was talking about. Let's talk about where does our money come from and then where are our expenses going? Um, and so, Carrie, you can talk maybe a little bit more about Race Don't Chase just to kind of review what you were saying, just to kind of go over that one more time because it's such an important concept. Sure, absolutely. So if we look at our pie, and then this, we didn't put a lot of data on here because everybody's situation is going to be different, but in our case, the red portion of our pie is funding from grantors and contractors. So that might be a foundation, it might be governor's crime commission or a county government or with the public health department, something like that. Um, then the blue slice of our pie is really the only billing revenue that we receive from Medicaid, Medicare, other sources like that. And then the yellow slice of our pie is our individual donors. So, with the race don't chase concept, 
you know, sort of on the one side, we're trying to work to minimize any impact on those pieces of our pie, on the red, blue, and yellow. So with a lot of the communications and reaching out to different people, um, you know, for the, for the blue billing portion, we're trying to make sure that we keep our productivity high, even in the midst of all of this transition. Um, for the yellow, we're really making a big effort to do outreach with donors. And I love Alejandro's idea about how we can do that even more and get more information out there. And then with the red piece, we're really reaching out to a lot of our funders, grantors and contractors and saying, um, you know, just confirming that they're still in a position to keep their committed funding levels and also watching and scanning that horizon as Luke was talking about to see and be aware of any new opportunities that come along. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. So that's sort of on the revenue side um, of, you know, where we might start to see some of those things diminish over time. So the race don't chase comes in with the expense side. We're trying to shrink the overall volume of the pie however we can so that the pie of expenses stays smaller than the pie of revenue as we move forward if that makes sense. Um, so we've you know we're cutting back wherever we can any non-critical areas of um, you know maybe travel or certain types of training or different expenses that aren't sort of directly related to making sure that we're maintaining services to clients we're trying to shrink those so that we stay in the black as we move forward through this time. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and just to go over what we were saying earlier is that this, this time we're, we're here on this graph and we're trying to think about what our activities right here will do to our budget in the next couple of months, obviously, but then further. Um, there's an opportunity we're about to talk about, which is the um, stimulus bill. We're all hearing about the stimulus bill. And if we get the stimulus bill money for a sm small business or a nonprofit, it could be significant. But then we also have to look at what are other funders within the bigger pie that maybe are also federal funding and may actually cause us to not get as much of that stimulus bill money or not be able to get it forgiven or we have to delay this project there's a lot of like how does this come in and affect everything else um and if people are saying too we want you to during this moment stop and address covid um are they wanting you to continue your current work like like you need to and add that on top because that's going to be actually more expense now we need to hire somebody else to help us to do that part too so there's a lot of like jockeying for position and trying to figure out what does this mean in this moment and how's it going to affect us right now and then in two weeks and, and then i think quite frankly just our staff's ability to think about all of this we're talking about this and and trying to figure out all the time oh and now i need to get back to my regular job that i'm committed to that i was already feeling over overburdened with before all of this some of you may be feeling that right now so just because there's dollars coming doesn't always mean it's going to get easier and I might just go a little more deeply into details. And again, this is where everybody's context is going to be entirely different. But just some of the thinking we've done about short term, uh, medium term, and long term, and the ways different things of different uh, funding sources may differ in the impact we feel over time. So, for example, with our individual donors, that's our yellow slice of our pie. Um, we're starting to feel that impact of the crisis pretty immediately. We actually had our biggest annual fundraiser planned for originally March 20th, and then um, we postponed it to May 1st, and now we're sort of recognizing, okay, probably that can't even happen. And so that's a pretty immediate term sort of crisis impact on our revenue line. So that's where we're coming up with these creative ideas, just like Alejandro had of, how can we reach out differently in an alternative way and also hold space for the fact that our individual donors are also feeling this economic impact and this economic uncertainty and, um, and, be, and be caring in our approach with our donors in that way. And then in terms of our blue slice of our pie, that's the billing. That's where Luke was referencing, you know, what we bill today, we probably won't see for another two or three months. So we're really not gonna know the impact there until we're probably already back into a transitional period. So we're trying to sort of plan for that moment when that comes. 
And then with many foundations, and I shouldn't even say this because I haven't checked the most recent rules, but the last time I checked, the rules for foundations were that they are, private foundations are required to give, it's either three or 5% of their, 5%, thank you, Janina, um, of their growth on their investments over a three-year average. So if their investments grow by you know, let's say a million dollars each year for three years, then their three-year average is a million dollars. So they're required to give at least 5% of that in any given year. So as they see the economic impact of the economy shrinking right now and those investments shrinking, um, this year they're still required to give from their average of the past three years. So we're really not going to see the shrinking of those sources of funds for another year, two years, three years. So again, sort of planning for the different stages of this um, crisis in this period as they roll out over time. And while you're talking, I think it's a good time to just go ahead and look at these opportunities. So this is the opportunities that we put in this table are ones that have come our way. Uh, some of them are going to be more region specific, but may have similar organizations like United Way in your area. Um, you've probably heard, I hope you've heard about most of these. Um, if you haven't, we're happy to go online or go offline and even talk more about it and send you links. Um, the first one is the biggie, the, the one that comes that can uh, help with up to, well, at least 75% of what, what you request has to be payroll. And then the rest can be rent and utilities and benefits. Um, and that you would get to borrow this and then have it forgiven um, after I think it's eight weeks um, of having received it. So, so this is money that if it is forgiven, that becomes a grant. And that's a huge amount of money um, that could potentially come. So that's just one, that's, that's leading the list because it's the biggest. But then there's others, you can see the different MCOs, Cardinal Innovations and Alliance have both mobilized. One put it out in the form of a grant, the other was in the form of a just automatic payment that comes to you based upon your previous billing to them. That's their stabilization program. Um, and that one didn't require an application, but even the Cardinal Innovations grant was like, I don't know, maybe three sentences or four sentences. It was really short, a very short budget. So people are making this easy for you to reach out and get some of these types of stimulus kind of fundings um, right now. And there may be others that people are seeing out there that we could tap into. There may be some national ones. Um, and those may be ones that you could chat into the list. And let's put those out on the La Mesita network because I'm just imagining there's people out there who are struggling who are like, oh, I don't have time to look for these things. But if we could say, here's one, and it'll take you an hour to fill out and send in, and it'll get you $10,000. That's a pretty big opportunity. Very worth it. Any others that are big ones that we should mention? We have one more slide, so it's, a, it's, a, it's about evaluation, but that's where we're heading with our presentation next. So we, we're happy to stop for a moment and just talk about budget and finances. Uh, Luke, hi, it's Glenn. Good to see you. You too. Um, um, the North Carolina Association of Grant Makers is a great site to try to keep on top of who's making what available to whom. So I would suggest people keep their eye on that one. Uh, because uh, on that one, you will probably see sources of funding that you normally may not be aware of. Uh, smaller foundations that are maybe as small as a county-based foundation. But nonetheless, if you're doing work there and significant work in that county, then you can say, look, we're really serving a lot of people here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would suggest that. Excellent. Thank you, Glenn. I just shared the link, I hope, to their website. I think that's the right one. Sure. I think I got the name right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in terms of, of funding and in terms of revenue generation, are you guys looking or trying, you, you, do you bill Medicaid? 
We do. We're, we're very small on Medicare. We're about um, maybe 25 to 30% people we serve have Medicaid, so we can yeah. build that. And then there's this other big pot that's traditionally been known as IPRS funding through the state. Right. That's called single stream funding. Um, coming down through those different MCOs, which right. is, of course, you have to be a contracted provider to get that already, so it's too late right. to kind of sign up all of a sudden. But those are funds that are out there. Um, they're always at risk, but right now they have them. Um, it depends on your contract and whether or not they'll add to. If you've already exhausted your funds for the year, you may not be eligible to get more funds from that. But yeah. so far they've seemed safe, even though they're making bigger, like I think uh, Cardinals was a million dollars that they're putting towards this um, relief grant. Um, I don't know really where that's coming from, but it's not touching the other contracts for the committed funding that's going towards those IPRS or single stream funding. Um, I don't know if they're coming from block grants or where they're getting it or it's from their reserve that they've built up that now they're putting out there. It's hard to know how that's happening in the background. And I, I know that we've been in regular contact with the Department of Human Health and Human Services saying, uh, hey, thanks for doing video codes, but we really need you to do this too. We need you to do DWI. We need you to do ADETs and making sure that they're appropriately considering the full spectrum of work that needs to be reimbursed. But by and large, they've gone there and they've done that. They've just poof, deregulated everything. It's, yeah. it's amazing. It's true. As a DHHS person, it's amazing what's happened in terms of relief, regulatory relief, which is a word we've thrown around for many, many decades. And mm -hmm. it's, only, it's only trotted out when it's a political promissory statement. You know, we'll, we'll make sure to give providers regulatory relief when we do X. And then, it, of course, never happens. So I, I am shocked, as are many of my colleagues at, at MIP management level of the changes that, and I really have to uh, hand it to the governor and Mandy Cohen mm. um, for, you know, brushing away a lot of the uh, dead leaves and branches and really getting things out there. Are you doing, um, so are you billing telehealth and are you billing uh, for um, sessions uh, on the phone? We are, and we've just seen the tele, like telephone sessions come through and pay within the last week, great. which is great. Um, I don't know if others are finding that they're getting payments already. Are people in general starting to see revenue come through for those? You are, Diana? Yeah. That's another, that's really the most shocking thing, that yeah. you're getting paid for changes this quickly, which... Yeah which is something else I wanted to mention, and that is that looking to the future, um, many of the things that we thought, you know, we fought for for many years with the state in terms of regulation, uh, we are now seeing suddenly can become a reality in a crisis situation, but the crisis will end. And there are, there are people who are starting to be talk about, let's keep the genie out of the bottle. Mm -hmm. Let's, despite all of the um, reservations that the state legislature has had about telehealth, that genie's out of the bottle. And I don't think, it, I don't think they have enough power to put it back in the bottle. So, yeah. so telehealth and, and uh, other ways of communicating with clients and patients are I think going to be part of the regular landscape in the future. Well, and um, I'm going to, this, yeah, another segue moment. I don't know if I'm just being opportunistic here, but this, this is our understanding of what are the arguments that we need to build to keep the genie out of the bottle. Um, and appropriately know when we need to put it back in the bottle or when we need to shift back to yes. non-virtual services. So we need to be real real clear and I think very thoughtful about this at this point in time. We can't just take one person who seemed to do great with this type of service and generalize it to our whole community and say, well, then it must be one size fits all, but let's go through. And so here what we have is a systematic way of looking through the different types of, okay, for the client or the patient, does this make sense? Well, who does it work well for? 
is it just old people or young people or middle people or is it for the technologically advanced? Um, are people satisfied? Um, and are they actually getting better? And then on a clinician level, yeah, I heard recently from somebody who said, I love this. I love working from home. I'm around I'm nature more. I'm going to, you know, get fresh lunch instead of packing it and it gets old by the time lunch rolls around. But is that really what we're about or should we be thinking about something else? Or maybe that is, maybe that's what refuels us and keeps us going. So we have to kind of go through this and right now is the time to be asking these questions now and then in the next three months and then in the next six months. And then the last one is where the DHHS level or the public health level is the one that I'm struggling with a little bit. What are the big picture items that we need to do to make sure that we understand how this is helping us so we keep it? Or do we go back and we say, um, yeah, it was good, but actually the telephone didn't help reduce isolation so much because now we're just encouraging people to be in their homes and not socializing. Uh, other people want to comment about this or the budget in terms of we're almost out of time. I don't want to and too quickly, but I do want to respect people's time. Well, if I could add something about the client patient level, um, telehealth and the phone, um, I'm hoping that what's happened here will stimulate a lot more, or should say probably uh, accelerate more research into comparative studies of telehealth and the phone with in-person sessions. Uh, the, the research to date is very scanty and the ends of those studies are very small. So I don't think we can talk uh, definitively yet about who it works for in terms of um, satisfaction or um, clinical efficacy. Um, so I'm hoping we'll, we'll see, I'm, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we'll see a lot more research on that. And then maybe we can begin to titrate, you know, who gets what and who it works well for. But I will say anecdotally that DHHS has got a lot of reports from patients, clients saying, we like this. Mm -hmm. Now That's just, you know, off the cuff. Can't say who it is or what they're getting or anything like that. That's helpful. And I'm conscious of our time here. I see it's 1259. I want to respect all of you, but I do just want to say this conversation is super helpful. And as Luke said in the beginning, we're still learning too. So if you have other suggestions or feedback or ideas for us as you move forward, um, funding sources, anything like that, please feel free to share. If other questions come up, please feel free to reach out. I don't know, Sophia and Juan, if it's possible to put my email address um, out with any follow-up communications that happen, but I would love hearing from you and happy to continue this conversation. Yeah, I think Sophia, just put your email in the chat. Um, oh. So brace yourself. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for jumping on and, and thank you, Luke and Carrie, for sharing um, some of these learnings. Um, and I think like we've mentioned, the hope is that we'll continue to have these meetings um, with a pretty a relatively good frequency throughout this um, COVID outbreak. Uh, just continue to make sure, like Lou said, that we keep that priority of helping our La Mesita partners um, stay afloat in this difficult time. So just want to say also thank you to all of you for, for joining and, and, and sharing all of the things that you've learned throughout this process. Yeah, thank you so much. Good to see you too. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. yeah.